Okay, welcome to today's lecture. So today we will be uh, doing the covering lemma proper and if time permits, uh, the packing lemma also. Okay, so let's see. Yeah, yeah so uh, here is a quick recap of what we did in the last few lectures. So last lecture, we saw the converse of the one-shot message compression problem, okay? So we saw that, uh, we saw this result, that for one short message compression, Alice's message length must be at least this quantity, okay? If the resulting distribution uh, by uh, the protocol P dot is epsilon close in L1 to the ideal distribution P, okay? So this epsilon feeds in out here and there's a delta out here and the price you pay is uh, given by this additive log one by delta, okay? So this was the converse prove via uh, data processing inequality. And then uh, we uh, give some general philosophical gyan of, about how uh, it is desirable to go from plain rejection sampling to what I would like to call a covering lemma in expectation, okay? So recall what, what does rejection sampling do? It takes as input a sample from this product probability distribution. So there's one copy of X and uh, N copies of Y, okay? So they're all, uh, independent of each other, okay? And uh, this is the input to the procedure and it and the uh, procedure outputs an index i ranging from one to n. And the only guarantee is that the resulting distribution x, y, i, okay? X and the i register here, x, y, i, is close to the ideal joint distribution, p, p x, y. Okay. However, rejection sampling does not give us a uniform index i. So uh, we had said that by the very nature, the process is sequential. So there's greater chance for I to be concentrated uh, more towards a small value, like I equal to one, two, three, four are much more likely to come than I equal to N minus 10 or something like that, okay? So it does not give a uniform I. And also it does not guarantee that the uh, samples of Y that you've seen till I are distributed independently according to the original probability distribution, uh, P1. Okay. That's because uh, if the procedure outputs I, it has uh, checked all the samples from one to I minus one, and it has rejected them. So this creates a bias, and these samples you cannot say are distributed according to the original distribution, uh, P1. So what we want today, which, which we are calling uh, covering lemma or convex fit lemma, is first of all a method to output a uniform index i. So the input is still the same, it's this product distribution, but I want to output a uniform index i, such that first requirement is the resulting distribution x, y, i is close to the ideal joint distribution. So far, so good. But now the remaining samples, y minus i, so y minus i includes all the samples from one to i, and all the samples i plus y i plus one, y i plus two up to y n. So all the other samples, I want them to be independent of x, y, i. So x, y, i have become correlated according to the joint distribution, but the other guys should remain independent of x, y, i. They should also be distributed independently of each other according to p1. Okay. So rather stringent looking requirements, okay? So all that this procedure has done, it has output a uniform index and managed to correlate X to uh, YI, the ith uh, guy out here, according to the ideal distribution. And the others are basically left untouched. Okay, so this is what we want. And this is what we're going to do. Any questions on the on what we have done, what so far the aims for today? No, let's continue. Yeah. So more precisely, we want to prove a lemma like this, which I'm calling the unipartite convex fit lemma. It's kind of uh, maybe, I mean, not a very enlightening name and it's also I mean, has baggage of notation. Okay. So the, the, the name unipartite is there because later in the course, we will see something called a tripartite convex fit lemma. Maybe I'll also remark on a bipartite convex fit lemma. So those are more complicated lemmas. So the simplest one I'm just calling unipartite. Okay. And convex split uh, because of the right hand side out here. So let's come to that. So what is this uh, lemma telling me? So this lemma tell, is telling me that 
I start off with the uh, product distribution, one copy of X and N copies of Y, all, okay, all independent according to the margins. This thing is magically close to the following distribution. Okay, so this is my uh, desired uh, sophisticated sampling algorithm. So, so what is uh, what is the right hand side? One has just correlated X with Y. Okay, and this index I is chosen uniformly at random, the one by n. And the other registers Y minus I are uncorrelated and untouched. I mean. The other registers YI continue to be independent of these two guys. They're also independent of each other. And each one of them is distributed according to the original uh, marginal P1. Okay. So these two distributions, in fact, turn out to be a five epsilon close if N is sufficiently large. So sufficiently large means it is two to the I max epsilon. Okay. And then there are some fudge multiplier factors. So this is uh, basically one by epsilon squared. So recall that uh, our rejection sampling had a milder dependence on epsilon. It was like log one by epsilon here. But uh, if you want the stronger statement of the convex fit, uh, the best that we can prove is one by epsilon squared. Simple question. So in, in this rejection and, sampling, hmm? uh, yeah, just a simple question, like uh, in this rejection sampling, uh, like this, this, uh, this protocol or this algorithm, this part I get that, you know, I mean, if it outputs some index i, then that right. particular yi, uh, should sort of so then x y i should be uh, like the distribution on x y i should be close to p x y, right. but the other registers uh, why do they have to be independent of everything else? Like I mean, no, no, so in rejection sampling they are not. In particular, yeah. the registers uh, y one to y i minus one, okay, huh. Huh. all get biased because they will reject them. The registers y plus one y uh, sorry y i plus one y i plus two so on. Those things I can say huh. that. Correct. They are independent and uncorrelated to X, Y, I, and the same as before. Okay, but whatever I've seen gets biased. Right. Okay. So I don't want that. I want a more sophisticated sampling procedure okay. where okay. all that happens is that X and Y are gets correlated, I is uniform, and that's it. Okay. So, so how do we do it? We'll come in a couple of slides. But before that, I mean, we should uh, be sure that this is even possible. So uh, in fact, it, it is very much possible these two distributions are already close. Okay. So this is what I said. This is an amazing fact which was not known till a few years back. I think this is the like that. These are the two things that are super surprising. One is that the distribution of the index is uniform, and whatever as a algorithm you have, the distribution of the index is uniform, and that uh, aside from the index that was chosen, all of the other indices have a have an independent independent product distribution on them. That's the most yeah. surprising part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So same as before. I mean, it's as if the others are untouched. Okay. So, so it's really magical. Like it's as if a random index i came out and x and y got correlated and the others are untouched. That's all the right hand side is. So, uh, so uh, this the authors call convex split because this is a convex combination of probability distribution and this splits the left hand side. So. It's not a very good name, but we will stick with it. So this is the, the uh, authors are not known for the authors are not known for coming up with very good names in. with very good names, but they're known for coming up with very good results. Yeah. So let's applaud them for that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean something simple like this. I mean you would think that this was known, but it wasn't. It's, it's very similar, simple, but it's really shocking. Okay. So it turns out one can actually prove this via rejection sampling style proof, a little more sophisticated rejection sampling, but we will see the original proof of the authors. It's a shorter proof and it uses more tools. It actually uses the Shannon relative entropy D, which we uh, know is a Rennie one divergence. And in fact, the proof proves something stronger. It says that the relative entropy between the left-hand side and the right-hand side is less than epsilon square. So by Pinsker, the L1 distance is like order epsilon. So really amazing, something stronger is even. And so why this equality, uh, this, equa uh, this uh, approximate equality in the theorem, this is L1 distance. L1 distance, yeah. So this is the notation for L, uh, close in L1. Okay, so this is equivalent to the falling lemma and that justifies the name covering lemma. So, the, so under the same setting as above, the same N and all that, consider the following. So 
I choose y1 to yn independently from the marginal p1. Now, once the symbols are chosen and fixed, okay, I will look at the conditional probability distribution x given y equal to yi. Let's say given y equal to y1. I look at the conditional probability distribution on x given y equal to y2, y equal to y3, so on. Now, take the average of these conditional probability distributions okay, over, the, over the, this set of sizes. So this is what I will call the sample average. So this term is a sample average. I claim this is close to the marginal, okay, or you, you may say the true average or something. So the sample average is close to the marginal in L1, 5 epsilon. And I claim that these two uh, statements are absolutely equal. Okay. And, the, and the, this form is closer to our intuition for, for covering. So more about it in the next slide. So what is the convex split statement pictorial in diagrams? So this is basically to remind you of rejection sampling. So the left-hand side of convex split starts off with independent samples, like one from X and N independent samples from one, all according to the margins. So uh, they are all independent of each other. That's what this parallel bar is. So that is uh, uh, something like five epsilon or here I'm not bothered about five, some epsilon close to the following uh, diagram. So th this is really the convex split. So in the first diagram, I have correlated X with Y1. Okay. And this diagram comes with weight one over n, and the rest continue to be independent. Second diagram, I correlate x to y2, the rest are independent. Last diagram, I correlate x to yn, the rest are all independent. P y1, P y2. All these diagrams come with weight one by n, and uh, and once you average these diagrams, you get something epsilon close to the left. This is basically what the convex split is guaranteed, and uh, a, a, uh, a very high level uh, hand wavy argument why such a thing may be true is the following that uh, if you look at any of these diagrams, most of the things are independent of each other. Okay, it's just x and go, has got correlated to some yi. Okay, everything else is uh, correlated, uh, is uncorrelated. So let's, for example, look at the correlation between x and y. So here, of course, they're correlated according to the joint distribution. But here, x and y1 are uncorrelated. Here, x and y1 are uncorrelated. Here, also, x and y1 are uncorrelated. Okay. So uh, if I do this average over all these diagrams, I expect uh, uh, in the average diagram, x and y will be nearly uncorrelated because only one by n mass of it is giving correlations. The others are not. So. So this argument, I mean, you can formalize without too much trouble. So this will guarantee that X cannot be correlated to Y1. X cannot be correlated to Y2. X cannot be correlated to Y3, dot, dot, dot. X cannot be correlated to Y. But note that these are pairwise correlations. So this does not guarantee that the average of this diagram looks something like X is correlated to some function of Y1 to Y. Okay. So it's not individually correlated much to any, uh, any one of them. But it is strongly correlated to all of them. Because if you see each of these diagrams, if you, uh, uh, if you condense all the y's together, uh, if you think of it as one unit, in each of these diagrams, there is good correlation between x and the bunch of y's. Okay. And you average them, you expect that there'll be good correlation between x and the bunch of y's. The amazing statement of convex split is that this doesn't happen. Okay. So, and why does this not happen? So the reason is, I mean, the, very deep. The reason is the, the amount of correlations that can leak out of the register X are actually bounded, let us say, by the entropy of X or even more crudely by the alphabet size of X. So, uh, so what I'm doing by this convex split is that I'm spreading the uh, correlations. What do you mean by, uh, like, I mean, I'm not able to interpret this term, like, uh, uh, correlation leaking out of uh, yeah yeah so X. so so let us uh, ask the following questions in good old information theory what is the maximum mutual information between x and z so the margin on x is fixed you are free to fix the joint probability distribution between x and z okay 
So what is the largest mutual information you can get between X and Z? Just entropy of X. Right. right? So if you think of mutual information as a measure of correlation between X and the outside world, the maximum correlation is the mutual information, upper bounded by the entropy. Okay. Okay. So something like that is going on out here. Okay. So so more precisely, I mean, you can say it is related to the IMAX, not really to the uh, Shannon mutual information, but the max mutual information. Okay. But that's basically the idea. So the total amount of correlation. Basically, you're saying saying that uh, uh, I mean, this is where the number n comes into play. That you take so many copies of y that. Uh, all these diagrams uh, essentially spread out all the randomness in in in, in the register x throughout no, all these. No, not so the randomness is... in the register. The correlation is leaking out. The correlation is between x and y. X yeah. is the same. I mean, the marginal x, on x is always p x, and I mean that's what I want at the end. Right. Okay. See, okay. I mean, none of these diagrams change the individual margin. So mm -hmm. I would expect that the marginals will all be p x, p y, uh, and so on. Okay. So if the correlation. So the point is the total number of correlations that can leak out of X in any joint probability distribution between X and the bunch of Ys is at most the entropy of X, okay? It's a finite quantity. Now if N gets very, very large, I mean, I note that N is not the entropy, it is two to the, uh, I mean, two to the mutual information, technically like two to the entropy, okay? So, I mean, very crudely, N is like the alphabet size of X. I mean, that, that's about as large as the entropy can be as large as log of the alphabet size. Even the max mutual information can be a, as large as the log of the alphabet size up to the log one by epsilon terms. This we saw last time. So it's two to the power of that. So it's, I mean, the worst case, this starts looking like the alphabet size. But yes, the point is the amount of correlation that can leak out is finite. So if N is large enough, what is happening is that this process of convex splitting is spreading the correlations thin. Like in the first one, the correlations are only between X and Y. The second is X and Y. So it, in a sense, it's spreading it thin. So after you do this average, there's no correlation between X and the bunch of Y. So this is some more intuition, but it's still not at all clear why this should work. Okay. So that's why it, it's, a, it's a shock really, and it was really unknown uh, so many years that such a thing can happen. But in hindsight, I mean, these are, these are the intuitions you can maybe tell uh, a beginner in information theory why such a thing may be true. Okay. But anyway, okay. So, so this is the statement of convex split. Now what is covering? So covering, I told you, like you choose N IID samples Y1 to Y N. Once the samples are fixed, I look at the conditional distribution X given Y1, conditional distribution X given Y2. And what do I want? I want the average of these conditional distributions should be, uh, well, here, I want the average of this conditional distribution should be close to the expectation Px. Okay. That is the state. Okay. So now let us see what is the L1 distance in the convex fit, right? So this is the convex fit state. This is the uh, fully product state. So you can easily see uh, by, I mean, writing it in terms of the symbols y1 to yn that this L1 distance has this expression. Okay? I mean, that is because uh, the marginals on Y are the same uh, for the second term. They're the same for the first term, you write it. The only difference in the first term, the, the distribution X depends on YI, okay? And, and in the second term, the distribution of X here is independent of Y. So that's it. Okay? I goes from one to N, that is. Yeah, and uh, but, uh, this thing is nothing but, uh, the L1 distance between the sample average of the conditional probability distribution. Uh, uh, Pranav, there's a, there's a small typo in the second statement. There should be a summation over X's inside the, uh, after the first. Uh, there period, should be summation over X. Yeah, yeah, you are right. There should be summation over X. Uh, somewhere, yeah, in fact, uh, yeah, there should be summation. Uh, just, just outside and, the mod, so there should be a mod. Uh, uh, covering the one over n summation minus. Well, uh, and yeah, I mean, this absolute value symbol should come here, actually. This yeah, 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 exactly. Should come right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So, and there should be a sum. So, I'll correct it in the actual slides. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there is a sum of this. Okay, 
Okay. Yeah. And uh, so, so, so this thing out here in the mod sign, correctly placed, is nothing uh, but the L1 distance between the sample average of the conditions and the true margin. Okay. And now, uh, and this term outside is the expectation over the choice of the samples. Okay. So this is precisely the statement of our covering lemma. So that's why I call it covering lemma for L1 distance in expectation. In expectation. So I said this last time and I repeat again, this statement of the covering lemma is stronger than the usual ones you may have seen in the standard information theory course. There they say that if you choose many samples, many means more than two to the n times the mutual information. Okay, so now we have a better picture. It is two to the n times two to the max mutual information, but which uh, in the ILE limit is n times the Shannon mutual information. Then they say that uh, uh, there are various versions. So the most common version is the uh, the a, a certain uh, mutual information quantity asymptotically goes to zero. Okay, now the those kinds of statements are not composable in the sense that if you use uh, the, those weaker covering lemmas, okay, so you get some protocol out of it. But if you use these protocols as subroutines and larger protocols, then often things don't add up. I mean, you cannot use the uh, subroutine as a black box. Okay. So we, uh, those statements boost composability, whereas we have a stronger statement in terms of L1. Now, if L1 is small, it will imply mutual information is small by uh, continuity of mutual information. So you, you can quantify what it is uh, exactly. So basically the log of the alphabet size will come in there. So, I mean, if this mutual information is at most delta, then delta times log of the alphabet size is, is uh, the mutual information. And uh, so this implies closeness in mutual information. And once L1 is under control, you can use it as a subroutine anyway. Okay. So this becomes a highly composable state. So in this course, we will always be talking about covering lemma for L1. Okay. And this is a covering lemma in expectation. So any questions about uh, what the statements of convex fit versus the statements of uh, covering lemma are? So this is a picture to keep in mind. Out. Okay, let's go. Okay, so now let's start proving the convex fit lemma. Okay, so this is the statement we want to prove. But before that, uh, let us finish the picture. Can you hear me? Ah, yes, Arun, I think. Yeah, yeah. So there is one comment I wanted to mention about the previous slide. Uh, so you you talked oh. about the uh, you talked about the. Um, the covering lemma in the IAD case, right? I think yeah. what you're stating is the, you're stating the covering lemma that is used in the coding theorems. And you are yes. uh, indicating that that is weak, but see, yes, there yes, is yes. Uh, there are quite a few uh, L1 covering lemmas. Yeah, uh, those are the by, soft covering lemmas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's the small cuff thing, right? Yeah, 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 I think those soft covering lemmas, essentially you can use it as a, uh, you know, plug and play in uh, most problems. Sure, 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 sure. I mean, the soft covering lemmas, yeah, yeah. By uh, traditional, I meant the stuff you'll read in Elga Malkin. Okay. Yeah, but, that uh, is true. Yeah, I've, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, the more modern stuff like uh, 2005, 6 onwards, Paul Cuff, the soft covering lemma, they are statements in L1, but they're still in the IID case, whereas this is in the one shot case. Okay, this will imply the IID thing. And, uh, but yeah, so the Paul Cuff soft covering lemma is this statement in the IID case. But uh, it is in L1 and in expectation over the sample. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, but uh, at the end of the lecture, we'll even prove something in continuity. So we'll even go beyond it. Okay. So what we'll say is that with overwhelming probability over the choice of the samples, this uh, L1 distance is close to five epsilon or six epsilon. Or yeah. Okay. So that is something which was not at least explicitly written down anywhere before, but we will prove. In, so interestingly, there was a, uh, this is, I mean, both groups did not know that the other group had proven soft covering, right? So I mean, there's Paul there, Cuff there was an issue a, of, of uh, Paul Cuff is, I think, the soft covering lemma came out around 2010-11 and Convex okay. it was 14. So if I remember correctly, there was a slight tussle. <laughs> ah, between but, them, huh? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. and the convict split uh, lever initially did not uh, state the covering angle. It is basically later on. I think maybe much even later. Split, much later. Uh, even I think the convict split authors did not realize that this is covering lever. I think much later, maybe when yeah, 20, to... 2020, 2020, 2020, there there was a paper where they remarked that yeah, this implies this covering. Yeah, we sort of realized it much earlier, around 16, 17. Earlier. Yeah, we realized earlier. So I don't think there was some diffusion between us and uh, uh, convict split guys. But, uh, yeah. yeah, but I see, the sure. covering was uh, proved by Paul Cuff in 2008 or seven in his thesis. So, uh -huh. uh, That's what I said, 2006. 2008 or something in his thesis, he has a proof of the covering lemma. I don't think in the 2011 paper he even gives a he even gives a proof. My guess is he okay. referred to the thesis because I only read the thesis which came out. It was his PhD thesis. No, but I I have seen a manuscript where sort of the outline of the proof is there, not much details, which I forget. I, that's why I said 2000. No, no, no he has the main proof in this paper called distributed channel synthesis. That was a 2010 2011 paper. Ah, okay. I mean, no, no, that yeah, is but, true. But see, yeah. the, the soft covering of uh, Paul Cove was proved in his thesis in 2008. We'll not go into that. I don't want to hijack the lecture, but it was proved in 2008. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so let's so surely, I mean, I mean, we should give credit to Paul Cove, but he only proved the IID lemma, whereas the convex split implies the one shot. Okay. So, and, and today we are even going to prove one in uh, concentration. So, yeah. So we are going to seal the deal in the hopefully by the end of this lecture okay so okay the, before we try to prove convex split uh let us finish the circle so i was saying that convex split is like a sophisticated rejection sampling so let's see why that is the case okay so now uh let us say i know the statement of convex split as a black box so here is how i can do a sophisticated rejection sampling so consider a new register i the index register so it can hold any integer from one to n now let me define a probability distribution alpha on the registers i, x, and y1 to yn, which is defined as follows. So the notation y subscript in square brackets n means the tuple y1, y2 up to yn. So how is this defined? The index i is chosen uniformly at random, one by n. Then the x and yi are correlated according to the joint distribution pxy. And the remaining guys, y minus i, are independent. Uh, according to the marginals uh, P1. So this is alpha. So this is basically the left-hand side of the probability distribution. Okay. Uh, with the, in, uh, sorry, this is the uh, right-hand side of the, uh, of the convex split statement with the index thrown in. Okay. So, I mean, this statement does not have a register for the index. I've thrown in a register for the index. So what is uh, the next probability distribution? Beta. So let us see what beta is. So beta is kind of like this, but uh, I mean, uh, beta restricted to the registers X and Y1 to YN is precisely this, but then we have to define what beta looks like for the index register, okay, I. Okay, so this is what I do. So the X I choose according to margin, and all the Ys I choose independently according to margin. So far, so good, left-hand side is there. Now the index I, I choose with the help of alpha. So remember this alpha is defining a conditional probability distribution on I, given x and the uh, y1 to y. Okay. So just use that condition probability distribution, choose i according to okay. So this is beta. So is the definition of beta clear and also alpha? Okay. So what does this buy me? This buys me the following. So this says that the distribution alpha on i, x, and the y's is uh, close to the distribution beta on i, x, and the y's. Okay. In, uh, not, not just close, in fact, the L1 is exactly uh, equal to the distribution of, that I get on dropping i. So this is why I have chosen uh, i according to the conditional distribution prescribed by alpha. Okay. So it's a simple calculation. You get equality. You can just drop this register i. And what convex fit is telling me and this is a left hand side, this is a right hand side of convex. This is telling me that it's less than five epsilon. Good. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so how does this help us? 
So in this rejection sampling procedure, Alice gets an n plus one tuple according to the product distribution as before. She chooses i according to the conditional dis distribution prescribed by alpha and transmits it. Bob outputs yi. I mean, the y's are there, the public coin. And we know that the resulting distribution is five epsilon close to py, simply because of uh, this thing. And what is the number of bits of message? Okay, log of n, and the log of n is uh, less than this point. Okay. So rejection simply would have given me log log one by epsilon. So this becomes log one by epsilon. But the main part is the same, i epsilon uh, max. Now the advantage of this method is that the uh, remaining samples y minus i are almost untouched. So once Bob uh, receives the message i, he will output yi. But now he can say that, oh my god, the remaining yi's are really untouched. So they can be reused for other tasks. So in that sense, the remaining yi's are like catalysts. And they save resources in a long series of information processing tasks. Suppose I did the message compression followed by something else, use this as a subroutine in something else. I can reuse this y minus i. So overall, I will start getting more efficient information processing protocols because these are like catalysts. Okay. There are other advantages also, which I alluded last time. So this allows me to improve the analysis of Martin's uh, uh, inner bound for the broadcast channel. Okay, It becomes very crucial for the quantum analysis. Then, uh, uh, yeah, and then there are uh, like other applications also. But at the very least, I mean, if you're doing a, a several information processing tasks, you can, uh, I mean, keep this catalyst around and save resources uh, in the long run. Okay. Sorry, I'll take this call.
Hello, hello. So, sorry about that. This is important call. Yeah. Hello. Am I audible? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So, uh, any questions about this? I mean, why why this is a nicer thing to have? Like we we have catalysts around, so which might be. Uh, I mean, uh, you shouldn't get thrown off by this plus two log one web epsilon out here. I mean, the real dominating part is the same, and uh, you can save resources if you have a long series of information. Okay, so let's dive into the proof. So we prove the convex split lemma using properties of the relative entropy. First, you have to prove the following technical result. Okay. So let's parse it slowly. It is not as scary as it looks. So suppose I have n probability distributions on x, which I'm calling mu1, mu2, up to mu n. Plus, I have one more probability distribution on x, which I'm calling theta x. Now, there is an underlying probability distribution on the index set. So the index set i is 1, 2, 3, up to n. So there's an underlying probability distribution, which I'm calling pi. Okay. Then, I have this equality about the Shannon relative entropy. Okay. So, so what is the distribution mu? Mu is the average of the mu i x, average according to pi. So the so so the left hand side is the relative entropy between mu, the average uh, distribution, and the other fixed distribution theta. So you can write it like this. So the, uh, so this is like the convex split. So the, uh, it's a uh, it's a certain uh, convex combination of these quantities. So in the first quantity, you can see that the individual mu i's appear here with respect to theta, the fixed theta. And the second one, the individual mu i's uh, square off against the average mu. So this you can prove directly from the definitions. Just plug everything in and simplify it, do the algebra and it will come out. But uh, we will see a, a, another proof, which is actually not shorter, but uh, I thought I would uh, present this proof so that I remind you of the chain rule of relative entropy. So let us define the probability distribution alpha on ix. So i is the index set, which goes from one to n, and x is the other alphabet as follows. So the index i is chosen according to pi. And uh, then given uh, that i is chosen, x is chosen according to the ith distribution mu1. Okay. And the second beta distribution is i is chosen according to pi and x is chosen independently according to theta. So you can see that i and x are correlated in alpha and i and x are uh, uncorrelated in beta. And you can also easily see that the marginal of alpha on x is mu, okay, the same mu as out here. The marginal of beta on x is theta, of course. And uh, the marginal of both alpha and beta on the index set is pi. Now, let us see, suppose I condition on the symbol little x. So I want to see what is the conditional distribution of the index set i, which you can evaluate from base rule like this, very easy. For beta, of course, uh, remember beta was independent between i and x. So even after condition x, I get the uh, good old marginal beta i, which is pi. I. So armed with this, I can apply the chain rule of relative entry. So look at the relative entropy between alpha i x and beta i x. So the chain rule splits upon, uh, into the relative entropy between alpha i and beta i plus the average of these quantities. Okay. So where uh, uh, remember i is chosen according to ps. This is the probability distribution on i. And now, uh, okay. So so what do you have to put out here? I have to put for uh, for the first argument here. I have to put the distribution. On x, I have to put the distribution on x coming from alpha condition on the index being i. So this I know very well is mu i on x. For the second guy, I have to put the distribution on x coming from beta condition on the index being i. So this I know very well that is just the good old. Thing. So this is the chain rule. And now remember alpha and beta are the same. So this relative entropy quantity is zero. So I get this very well. Now I'll go back to the left-hand side out here and I will apply the chain rule the other way. I'll first take the register X and then I'll expand according to that. Just, just like it. Okay. 
ক্লাস করছো ডিস্ট্রিবিউশন বিটা আই কন্ডিশন অন লিটল এক্স so i know what is alpha uh, i condition x and beta i condition x so I plug those quantities in uh, then uh, and then uh, uh, this expectation uh, uh, so x is chosen equal to alpha x i know that the marginal of alpha on x is mu x so i plug this in so this is what i get and just by cancelling and rearranging terms i can get this so what have i got when i compare these two so Right? So if I compare these two, I get the statement of this length. Yeah, so this is the left hand side and the, the difference is coming. So any questions about the simple manipulation? Yeah. So anyway, I mean, you don't have to prove it this way. I mean, you can just plug in all the definitions out here and check it for yourself. Okay, so, so the, really, I mean, the proof is not great, but what is great is, I mean, imagining that, I mean, there can be proof along these lines. This is the, so really, I mean, realizing that this is the statement one has to prove, and then, I mean, you'll see how we're going to use it. Okay, so we are not uh, going to prove the convex split lemma. So this is the statement that we want to prove. So remember, this is the smooth max mutual information. So let P prime x y attain the optimum in the definition of the smooth max mutual information. So smooth max mutual information by definition is this d epsilon max. So uh, so because of the smoothing, the okay, so the P prime attains the optimum. So P prime is close to the original distribution P. It is also uh, dominated by P point wise, but the, uh, we don't require it. At the moment out here. So I'm just saying that this is close, epsilon close to P in L1. Now let me define two probability distributions alpha and beta. Okay, so both the distributions on X and Y1 to Yn. Okay. So alpha is uh, basically like the right hand side of convex grid, except that X is coordinated to the ith uh, register yi according to P prime, not according to P. Here it was P, here it is P prime. The remaining registers are uh, independent and according to the good old margin in PY. And beta is just the left-hand side of the convex grid, product of all the distributions according to the original margins. Now, we want to prove the convex grid uh, inequality. Like we want to say that this, uh, the L1 distance between these two guys is less than five or seven. So I can use triangle inequality. And uh, in the first term here, I can replace the joint distribution PXY by the joint distribution P prime X. So if I do that, I get alpha. And the second guy here is beta. So suppose I can prove that this L1 distance is less than four epsilon. Then I can combine uh, it via triangle inequality with this uh, constraint, okay? And get the five epsilon, four epsilon plus this epsilon gives me five epsilon. So it suffices to prove that alpha is close to beta in L1 to within 4 epsilon. And for which in turn it suffices to prove that the relative entropy of alpha with respect to beta is less than epsilon square due to Pinsker's inequality. So actually I get something slightly better. I'll get uh, two times square root two, but I'm just upper bounding it by four out here. Okay. But yeah, so I'm just being a little imprecise uh, uh, to, make, to make the notation seem less simple. So it suffices for our purposes to show that this relative entropy is less than epsilon square. So how are we going to show it? So let's start. So we are going to apply this lemma for the analysis. So, so the relative entropy of alpha, this will be that. Now remember alpha is an average. Okay, so alpha is like the mu of the uh, 
this lemma. It's an average of the mu i's. So these are the mu i's. Okay, the joint distribution of p prime on x y i times p y minus i. So there were this mu uh, mu i's here and the average distribution. Okay, okay so so alpha is the and here the p i's are all one by n. So alpha is the average of uh, some uh, distribution alpha i. Okay, and this beta is like the theta, the fixed distribution of my lemma. So when I apply this, this is the statement that I get. So the so all the probabilities are one by n that comes out. And now I'm looking at the relative entropy. So what is the first term out here? The first term out here is the relative entropy between mu i and the fixed distribution theta. So this is the ith distribution alpha i, ith term here, and the fixed distribution theta. The second term is the relative entropy between mu i and the average distribution mu. So this is uh, alpha i and the average distribution. So that's it. And now I have this very important inequality, which I'm going to explain. So uh, is this equality clear to everybody? This is the application of the lemma in the previous slide. Yeah? OK. OK, now comes this crucial inequality. So if you see what is what I'm doing out here, so what are the registers here? The registers here are x, y1 to y n. Here, 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 as well as here. The registers are in total x, y1 to y. But here, the registers are just two, x and y. X, y are here, 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 as well as here. So in the ith term, I only have the registers x and y. Okay, so in the first term out here is x and y1, second term x and y. So something has happened going from here to here. And also uh, some new notation alpha hat i on x, y has been defined. So this is the definition. Alpha hat i on x, y, i. It's a certain distribution on x, y, i. Uh, no, I mean, no, wait, wait, wait uh, just, just a sec. So, so, so in, the, in, the, in the first term, uh, after the inequality, essentially, uh, you're tracing out uh, everything else but the i th register. Right? Right, right. Yeah, yeah, so I'm coming to that. It's all written below. Okay, so how I'm getting that is all written below out here. Okay. So, I mean, if you care to read, I think your questions will be answered. So, I'm just going over the notation and saying which registers uh, are active in uh, which term. Okay, so, so I want to say the ith term here only involves the registers x and y. And there's an alpha hat i, it's a certain probability distribution x and y, which is defined as follows with probability 1 by n. Uh, take the sub distribution p prime on x and y i, and with probability one minus one by n, take the product distribution of p prime x. So this is the marginal coming from p prime, and uh, p y. This is the original margin. It's slightly weird thing. So why I've defined it this way? This is what Shantan just said. This alpha hat i on x y i is the marginal of the whole alpha on these registers x y. So you discard the registers uh, y minus i. This is exactly what I'll get. So remember what was uh, the whole alpha. So with probability one by n, I am at uh, p prime x y i, and then these other guys are discarded. So that is the first term, probability one by n p prime x y. And if I take some uh, j not equal to i, then sure x is correlated to y j. But if I look at uh, the behavior on the registers x and the y i, okay, why uh, this i is in the minus j part out. So they are independent. So I will uh, get p prime on x uh, times uh, y i out. Which is coming from. Is it?
Okay, sorry about that. Yeah. So alpha hat i is the marginal of alpha on x y i, which is now clear. Okay. And now we are using this inequality that uh, the data processing inequality. So if I uh, if I uh, discard the registers y minus i, then the relative entropy can only go down. Okay. So uh, so going from here to here. So okay. So uh, going from here to here. I mean this minus term out here. I'm using data processing and because of the minus the inequality reverses. And for the first term, I claim that these two are equal. So uh, the relative entropy between uh, p prime x y i uh, times p y i minus one. This is beta. So if I uh, so if I expand it out, what is this? This is the first term. Beta is just this term. Okay, is the same y i minus one out here. So just plug it into the formula for relative entropy, and you'll see that it is uh, equal to this quantity. You can simply discard the other uh, registers y minus i because they are in uh, uh, product distribution. So is this clear? So so for the first two terms there was equality, and uh, here there was inequality. Actually, if you look at it, it in the other direction, but because of the minus. Okay, any questions? Okay, so we are almost there. That's it. Okay, so we want to prove the statement convex split. So let's just give a shorter notation I max is the smooth max solution information. Remember, p prime was the optimum in the smoothing. So this is actually a d max of p prime with respect to product of the marginals according to the original p. This was my alpha. This was my beta. Okay. And here I'm going to use the p prime is uh, point was dominated by okay, the smoothing p prime. Okay. And n is my uh, is this quantity, okay, which is carefully chosen. Okay. So let's come to alpha hat i. Remember what was alpha hat i? It is what I get coming from alpha when I discard uh, the registers y minus. So uh, this is alpha ha uh, hat uh, i. Now I'll use uh, my inequality. So remember uh, this i max, this smooth i max, which I'm just calling i max here, is, a, is the actual d max for this quantity. So this means that p prime x y is less than or equal to two to the i max times the second term out here. Okay, the product of the mark. So this is from the definition of Dmax. The first term is from the from the definition of Imax epsilon, and the second term is from the property of p prime x y. So namely this property that it is uh, less than or equal to p x y. Okay. So uh, p prime x y is less than or equal to p x y. So in particular, the marginal p prime x is less than or equal to p x. So uh, I am increasing p prime to p out here, and p y i remains the same. So once I do this, so uh, this simplifies to this quantity. So I've actually proved that alpha hat x y i is less than or equal to this vector. So the so this is not a probability vector because uh, this uh, I mean this quantity is larger than one. So the so so it's a positive vector whose entries sum up to something greater than one. But doesn't matter. I can still define relative entropy using positive vectors. Same formula. Now I'm uh, computing the relative entropy between p prime x y i and alpha hat x i. Right? So remember, uh, this is the second term out here. I want to make sense of that. Okay. So I'm replacing alpha hat i by something larger. And remember, in the expression for relative entropy, alpha hat i appears in the denominator. So if I replace it by something larger, it, uh, the quantity of relative entropy will only get smaller. So I get this greater than or equal to. So I put this larger vector out here. And this you just plug into the formula and you get this equality. So you get this, and this is a constant which comes out, and then I mean, this is a log. And now I just plug in this value of n out here. Then I use uh, usual uh, inequalities like one plus y is less than e to the y, e to the power uh, y, and so on. And I can uh, plug all these things and conclude that this is larger than. Uh, D minus epsilon. So uh, this is uh, the second term. 
And recall that this is the first term. This is the first term also. So we are done. So this just ties, uh, ties up together. So this is uh, what I was trying to prove for convex split. I wanted to, I had de de defined alpha on all the registers, beta on all the registers. I wanted to show that the relative interval has been epsilon square. So I use the lemma to write it as uh, an average of these quantities. So the ith term is, a, is this difference. And I just showed that this difference is less than epsilon square in the previous slide. And now I'll apply Pinsker and I get this. And then finally, for the original convex split, uh, I remember, like, I have to just show that this is less than uh, 4 epsilon. I mean, it's in fact, less than 2 square root 2 times epsilon, even smaller, plus this epsilon, which is coming from converting the P prime here to P here, triangle inequality. And overall, I get 5 epsilon. OK, so this is the proof of the convex split. Any questions? Yeah, I mean, it's an amazing proof. Yeah, hats off to the. So I should, I think, I mean, uh, name the people behind the original Congress is Rahul Jain, then Vamsi Krishna Devabhatini, and uh, Anuragan Shri. So they are the ones who proved the Congress. Yeah. Now, so, so far, uh, we did convex split, which is the covering lemma for L1 in expectation. Now, I want to prove the covering lemma for L1 in concentration, which I promised. Okay. So, I mean, such a statement is... Rab, uh, I, I just have a quick question. So, huh. um, in, the, in, in the concentration result, uh, shouldn't, uh, shouldn't a log-log uh, alphabet term appear in the bound on N? No, no, it doesn't. So, that's why I said this is uh, not known. It's it's new. New. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. So, yeah, okay, so uh, so it's the same thing, the sample average of the conditionals. Uh, I'm looking at this L1 distance from the marginal on Px. So uh, I know that the average uh, of this L1 distance over the choice of the samples y1 to yn is less than 5 epsilon. Now suppose I want to go above the average 5 epsilon by an average term of delta. Then uh, the probability sharply drops off it is less than this exponential quantity. So it's exponential in the sample size n, okay? and then delta square by two. Okay, so how do we prove it? Proof is very simple. So we prove it using McDermott's method of boundary differences, which is derived in term from Azuma's inequality on concentration for Martin Bates. Okay. Uh, Pranav, can I just ask a very quick question? Yeah. So uh, maybe I'm jumping the gun, but this McDiarmid is like uh, you have a function which is on n uh, n uh, coordinates. Yeah, yeah. So shine some. I mean, why don't you why don't you read what is written? Your query will oh. be answered. Okay. So I'm explaining uh, how to apply McDiarmid. Okay, okay, okay. okay. So consider the function f, uh, whose domain is uh, y to the power n. So the alpha, uh, I mean n uh, uh, n fold Cartesian product of the alphabet y, and the range is the real numbers from 0 to 2, okay, both endpoints included, close interval 0 to 2. And this is the thing. Okay. So uh, uh, the function takes its input and n triple y1 to yn. And this is what it outputs. It just uh, looks at the conditional distribution on x, given y equal to yn, averages it, uh, looks at the l1 distance from px, and that's, that's the output. This can be anywhere from 0 to 2. Then, so here is where the word bounded difference makes sense. So let us say I pick any n triple y1, y2, y3, yi up, dot dot up to yn. And I change the i uh, sample yi to yi prime. So yi is something from the alphabet y. I change it to yi prime. Okay. So uh, fix an i uh, from one to n and change the uh, i sample. The boundary difference condition says that the difference in function values, okay, where everything is the same except yi has been changed to yi prime, this is less than some bound two by n. Okay, so the boundary difference means that whatever y and y, uh, whatever yi and yi prime are, this uh, absolute value is upper bounded by this quantity. Okay. So two by n. So this is very easy to prove. Just triangle inequality. 
Then next DLM is method of bounded difference. So all that requires for bounded difference is that uh, take a function which depends on a uh, n-fold Cartesian product whose domain is an n-fold Cartesian product. No uh, explicit dependence on the set size as long as it's greater than one. Okay. So take a function whose domain is the n-fold uh, Cartesian product of a uh, set. And you, uh, I put a probability distribution py on this set. And I, and I will be uh, uh, doing my concentration, et cetera, under the n-fold product distribution. And I have a function which maps an n-tuple to real numbers. And it satisfies boundary differences in the sense that the if I just vary the ith coordinate, the function value varies by at most ci. Okay, so ci is something which can only be a function of i. It cannot be a function of y i y y prime. Okay. Now, what Bagdian says that uh, the probability under the uh, independent choice of uh, y one to y n from uh, the product distribution. So the probability that the function value deviates from its expectation by more than delta is bounded, upper bounded by the exponential quantity. So what is the exponential quantity? Uh, and there's a similar one for the lower bound also, same thing. Okay. So often uh, people put an absolute value and put a factor of two out here, but here we're only interested in the upper case. So we'll even save on this factor of two also. So is exponential in, so minus two times delta square. So whatever this delta is, delta square comes out here. Now divided by, Summation ci square. So what was ci? Ci was the bounded difference in the ith coordinate. So you just take the sum of the squares of the bounded differences. And that's exactly what I've done out. This is like the end bit. And this, if you evaluate, it will come. And now I know that the expectation of f is less than 5 epsilon. So the proof is complete. So very important point, note that the bounds in the expectation as well as the concentration version of the covering lemma do not involve the alphabet size of x and y. Okay. So even in the expectation version, the alphabet sizes play no role out here. Okay. So, uh, so if, if, we, if we did, let's say we did it in the Chernoff style, uh, then the alphabet size would come in because at some point you would have to take a union bound, right? Yeah, yeah. so the, uh, if you did Chernoff uh, style, you, uh, you'd get an n out here. Yeah, you'd get an n out here, but uh, that, that comes because of the union bound. And, we can't directly apply Chernoff like this because no, no, no. Uh, there is no independence. Uh, yeah, but, no, no, you, uh, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you cannot directly apply Chernoff uh, out here. Well, uh, I mean, the, we apply ch ch Chernoff coordinate by coordinate. And when I say coordinate, yeah. I mean the coordinates of the probability distribution or the probability correct, vector. Correct. Yeah, right. yeah. So we are, yeah, yeah, we are trying to. In fact, uh, bounded coordinate by coordinate. In fact, we are doing a stronger thing there. We are actually bounding the L infinity uh, norm of this difference. Okay. Okay. And because you're bounding coordinate by coordinate, you get an N out. Yes, yes. But so um, you have to but bound this... a, uh, yeah. But if you want to bound L1, you don't have to bound coordinate by coordinate. Okay. So this, yeah, so this, I, I, I just this is a new realization. How, yeah. What is this dare we essentially doing? I mean, it's somehow. Uh, Working around taking the union bound, this core it's working around taking the coordinate by coordinate turn of yeah, 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 it does. Uh, okay, okay, yeah. okay, so the, okay, I mean, that's I the see. power of McDermott's method. That, uh, okay. Okay. I mean, as long as you have a product set as your domain and you have product mm -hmm. distribution on that, okay, okay, I mean, so as uh, long as this y1 to yn are uh, coming from a product distribution, you can correlate them in any way you want using this function mm -hmm. f. And you will get a concentration result. That's what yes. I'm saying. Yeah? Yes. So, so, you, so you can reprove the good old chain of for the uh, binomial distribution from it. Okay. All you need is bounded inference. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, very, very popular. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, one should have realized it uh, like uh, I don't know five years ago, but uh, again, I think somehow, uh, I mean, uh, nobody is explicitly. Written it in black and white in the future. So here we are. <clears throat> okay. So any questions? Okay, if not, okay. So we are done with covering. So we have proved covering in concentration, covering in expectation, convex split. So now we'll close the chapter and we'll go to the packing lab. So as I said, I mean, uh, 
proof arguments in information theory are of two broad paradigms, covering and packing. So we've seen the covering, and now let's see what is packing. So here is the diagrammatic difference between them. So in covering lemma, what do I have? I have some samples chosen, let us say IID uh, from some alphabet Y, according like to the marginal PY, Y1 to YN. And then I'm looking at the conditional distribution of X given Y1, of X given Y2, and so on. Okay. So covering says that if I take the sample average of these uh, conditional distribution of these boxes, I'll get close to the uh, marginal on X, which is PX. So that happens because these boxes co cover more or less every point out here. Maybe you can lose an epsilon fraction under the, the marginal, but yeah, almost all points are covered. That's why the name cover is. And the way they're covered is that the boxes also overlap. But again, the overlap is not too much. I mean, uh, if the overlap was too much, if this point appeared uh, as the common intersection of many boxes, then this would have too high a probability. So that is not allowed by covering. So there can be some overlaps, but yes, uh, every point is covered by means of some overlaps. So that is covering. Packing is different. Packing, I want the boxes to be disjoint. Okay, so, so what are boxes? So these are the conditional probability distributions. I want to say that the conditional probability distributions are pretty distinct from each other. Okay, so sure, they can have some overlap, but the overlap is in a very, very tiny probability. Okay. So they're almost disjoint from each other. So they're distinguishable from each other. So that's where the name packing. So, I so the overall space that is there in the alphabet X is given by the uh, marginal PX. So I want to pack the overall space by disjoint boxes, by disjoint conditions. And the question is, what is the uh, maximum number of uh, uh, boxes I can put in uh, so that they remain distinguishable and uh, I can achieve the packing. So remember for packing, I want to maximize the number of boxes I, I uh, push in to keep them disjoint. Okay. And in covering, it is the minimum number of boxes I have to put in so that I cover everything. So packing is inherently a maximization uh, problem. Covering is inherently minimization problem. Now in the IID world, I mean, uh, the, these distances, the difference get blurred. Like they will all say the number of samples is like two to the n times the Shannon mutual information. At best, there will be an inequality. Like packing, it will be less than or equal to covering will be greater than or equal to, but that's. But here the differences are stark in one shot. So packing in one shot says that I can go less than or equal to two to the i epsilon min. So, so these many boxes can be packed in, keeping things disjoint. Covering says that I need at least two to the i epsilon max. So I need at least these many boxes to cover every point. So even the quantities uh, get differentiated. Okay. So this is what I meant vaguely earlier that i epsilon min controls the packing arguments and i epsilon min controls the covering arguments in the picture. And formally, the packing lemma in expectation is this. So let us say n is, so more formally, n will be epsilon times this. Remember in covering, uh, n was um, n was two, uh, 2 to the i epsilon max the, divided by epsilon square. Okay, so it was uh, like significantly bigger than this. So here uh, in packing, not only is it i epsilon min, which is smaller, but it is also significantly less than that. It is epsilon times this. But anyway, I mean, as, as I said, I mean, this doesn't matter so much. What matters is this i epsilon min. But yeah, so let n be less than or equal to this. So, uh, okay. So now the claim is for every sequence of uh, symbols y1 to yn, there exists a private coin decoding algorithm, which depends on this sequence. It is tailored made for the sequence such that the following thing holds. So the private coin uh, decoding algorithm is fed a sample. Okay, so how is the sample done? Uh, so my sample is y1 to yn. So choose y1 with probability one by n, okay? Generate a sample from the conditional uh, on x given y1 and feed it to the decoding algorithm. Okay, so that's what this is doing. The decoding algorithm will try to guess what is this yi? What is, what is this yi from which it came? Okay. 
And the probability that it fails is, it's not equal to YL. So I'm now looking at this, uh, the failure probability of the decoding average towards the sample. Okay, so this is the average failure probability, average lower samples. And now I can take the expectation over this over the independent choice of sample. So this should be less than two epsilon. Okay. So packing line expectation says that this is the case. For every sequence, Y1 to Yn, there is a clever private coin decoding algorithm. So this decoding algorithm is actually not deterministic. It's a randomized private coin decoding algorithm. So there's a decoding algorithm which can decode this sequence, okay? In expectation, it means that if, if I if I choose a typical sequence y1 to y and iid from uh, uh, py, then the decoding algorithm uh, will have uh, uh, like failure probability over the sample of at most two epsilon. Is the statement clear? So, uh, Pranav, I just have a couple of questions. So, one which is related to this statement. So, is it Shantan, uh, you really for every sequence or for a hype of sequences with high probability? Uh, oh, your voice got cracked, but I think I understood what is it. I mean, you're asking uh, if the decoding algorithm exists for every sequence. Yes, yes, yes. That this is. Yeah, so the decoding algorithm strong, exists right? for every. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. So the decoding algorithm exists for every sequence, but for uh, certain sequences, it will not do well. What I'm saying is that the performance of the decoding algorithm for an average sequence is. To epsilon. Okay, but for a bad sequence, the okay. decoding okay. algorithm might have okay. uh, failure probability one. That's fine. Okay, but there's a decoding algorithm for everything. Okay, I see. So, so you're uh, hiding that inside the expectation. Yes, I'm hiding in the expectation. Okay. So I, but you, but you see, Hello? even in the proof, surely I'm hiding it in the expectation. But you see, even in the proof, I'll get a decoding algorithm for every sequence. But when I analyze the performance of the decoding okay. algorithm. Okay. I'll get this expectation. Okay. Uh, I, I had another question also, which is not directly related to this dilemma. So, hello? Hello? Yeah. I mean, go. Yes. So, in the asymptotic ID setting, there is this very nice threshold behavior, right? That uh, when you sample points below the threshold to, to the mutual information between X, Y, you have mm -hmm. packing, and but you just go above the threshold and this. Stein type of or uh, Sanoff type of arguments will tell you that you will make a mistake, that uh, it will make yeah, the mistake so, of thinking. Yeah, but here there is no threshold. There is a, actually a, like a gradient. Yeah, yeah. So, right? yeah, yeah. So, so there's a gradation. So, uh, I mean, uh, very nice uh, observation. So, we'll see this model in the next lecture when we look at the noisy channel coding. And we'll see that, uh, like, if you want, uh, like, uh, error epsilon for the noisy channel coding, then the quantity is uh, i epsilon min, okay. And now, right, uh, right. but you can increase this epsilon all the way from uh, near zero to near one, okay. And we know that uh, as epsilon goes from near zero to near one, okay. So I smoothly go from i epsilon min. Min to uh, I, 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 I one minus epsilon max, yes. Yeah, so i one minus epsilon min is basically i epsilon max, okay. So, uh, so the so the one shot theory tells us that the rate uh, can be increased at the cost of increasing epsilon. Okay, so okay, okay, uh, okay. so I, if I want uh, error less than epsilon, the rate is I epsilon min. But then if epsilon increases to some epsilon prime, then surely the rate goes up to I epsilon prime. Then if the rate, uh, error increases all the way to one minus epsilon, then surely the rate goes up to I uh, one minus epsilon min. Okay. But the point is in the IID limit, all of these quantities go to n times the mutual information. So it looks like sharp increase. Okay, okay, okay. So in okay, that, so in the, what you're saying is in the middle region, I mean, at least in the one shot theory, what it tells us that in the, in the middle region where uh, uh, this packing and covering theorems don't hold, you can actually crank up your epsilon more and at the cost Correct. of a higher probability of error, you can increase the rate. You can, you can yeah, do, yeah, yeah, do, yeah, yeah. do so, better. Yeah, yeah. So, the, so there's nothing here which uh, in the packing memo which says the epsilon should be less than half or anything. Okay. I mean, okay. Okay. Things, got it. Yeah. Things may go. I mean, thing. Well, there are these losses epsilon to two epsilon, so maybe that will kick in. But uh, yeah. So, but we'll analyze this. Uh, cracking. So these are called strong converses. So we'll analyze this with our lens of one shot, and we'll see this uh, 
kind of smooth increase. Okay. And we'll see that if you're doing IID, why the strong converse behavior comes. We'll have a much deeper understanding. Yeah, let's go ahead. Okay, so the uh, okay, so the proof for the packing lemma. So the, this is just uh, something you're familiar with. The proof uses a random code book and sequential decoding algorithm. So we already saw this uh, uh, argument at a high level when we recapitulated Shannon's uh, proof. Uh, Shannon's uh, proof of the noisy channel. Shannon's channel coding theory. Yeah, yeah, in the asymptotic IID. But now we are going to basically, basically redo that proof uh, in the one shot. So I mean, notation I mean is this I epsilon mean. Okay, and uh, I epsilon mean by definition is this D epsilon mean. So let M be the optimizing vector in this definition. So what, what do we mean by that? So M is a vector where each coordinate lies between zero and one. Then the dot product of M with P is equal to one minus epsilon. So we know that the optimizing vector actually give, uh, gives me the success probability for P with equality, so one minus epsilon. So this is the success probability of P. Remember, the vector M can be thought of as the, uh, uh, vector M can be thought of as the uh, success probability of uh, uh, a hypothesis testing algorithm, a private coin hypothesis testing algorithm. So on Fed, the ideal hypothesis, uh, one accepts with probability one minus epsilon. And if you uh, feed in the uh, imposter hypothesis, which in our case is the product of the marginals, then my uh, private coin hypothesis test will accept only with probability two to the minus epsilon, two to the minus i mean. Okay. And again, this is equality for the optimization. So we had argued on this thing. So this is what we have for it. So consider now the following sequential decoding structure. So the input is a sample x0. So remember, for, for the packing lemma is this, I mean, uh, like I want to design this decoder. So uh, I think, uh, yeah, correct. Uh, yeah, so, so, so remember uh, 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 like somebody chose uh, some yi, the, the symbol yi, okay. uh, and uh, from yi, uh, uh, from this- So which is my variable? Yeah, it, it will become clear. Okay, so so which one is my code? Well, there's no code book out here. The, I'm uh, I'm talking of the packing lemma. Huh? Okay. So, uh, if, I mean, if you're talking of the code book, the code book, uh, uh, the the messages of the code book will be indexed by y1 to y n. If you if you want to interpret it that. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so this okay. is y1. One to y is like my peak. Yeah, so it's, so uh, in which both Alice and Bob know, right? Yeah, yeah. So they know the set y one to y n. Alice and Bob know the set uh, y one to y n. Okay, but they don't know which y i has been picked. At, at, yeah. least, at least let us say Bob doesn't know which y i has been. Okay, picked. yeah. I mean, if if I think of uh, channel coding uh, kind of thing from Alice to Bob, so. Uh, all parties know the uh, the uh, full set y uh, full sample uh, set y one to y n. Then Alice chooses a y i which Bob doesn't know, okay? and then she generates uh, a sample x from p x given y i. So let's call a particular sample from this distribution x now. Okay. So I'm now talking of Bob's decoding uh, sequential decoding stuff. So what Bob sees, Bob just sees a sample x now. And Bob wants to figure out the symbol y i that possibly generated x naught from uh, the conditional uh, p x x given y i. Okay. Right, and the picture is this. So Alice cho chose, let us say, y two. Okay. Bob does not know it. And then uh, from y two, she generated a sample from this box, happened to be x naught, and that was sent to Bob. Bob sees x naught, and he has to figure out y. The point is because these boxes are more or less disjoint, the, no matter what X naught is generated, Bob with high probability will know that it must have come from work. So that's the idea of the packing lemma. So here's what Bob does. So formally, Bob will do a sequential decoding. So he'll run through all possible uh, samples, Y1 to Yn. Okay? So here's the for loop, I going from one to N. So let us say Bob is processing 
why I Sorry about that. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, let us say that uh, decoding algorithm is processing uh, Y, the candidate Y. So, and the decoding algorithm sees only X naught, okay, the actual uh, sample that was produced, X naught. So, what uh, decoder will do, he will accept uh, X naught with probability this. Okay. Remember, the, uh, uh, this is a certain entry in the vector M. It's a quantity between zero and one. You just accept X naught with this problem. If acceptation occurs, so the de uh, alg decoding algorithm will output Y and stop. If acceptation does not occur, go to the next situation. And if all iterations are uh, exhausted, you just declare error. So this is very naive decoding strategy. Hard to believe that it does anything good, but as you'll see, it is really good. Okay, so suppose Y I naught is the actual symbol that uh, generated the sample X. So I want to analyze what happens for a fixed I less than I naught. Okay, so uh, uh, remember uh, success occurs if the decoder outputs Y naught. That means some I which is less than I naught should be rejected. Okay. Or rather the error probability will occur if Y I gets accepted. So, so the expected probability, so the expectation is over the choice of the samples y1 to yn. Okay, so the expected probability that the decoder accepts symbol yi, given that it reached the ith iteration, is as follows. Okay. So, so suppose it somehow reached the ith iteration, then it will accept x0 with this probability. Okay. And x0, remember, x0 is actually generated from i0, not from i. So it is generated with respect to this condition probability. Okay, so this is one particular sample X naught. I have to average over all X naught to get uh, uh, the probability of decoder accepting at ith iteration. And then I'm looking at the expected probability of error. So there's the whole uh, sequence Y1 to Yn, but only the relevant ones here are the Yi and Yn. Okay. And now I just move that uh, formula for the expectation out here. Okay. So, uh, so if I if I put in p y uh, y i naught that gets multiplied with this condition probability, so I get the joint probability of x naught and y i naught. P y i, remember like is the independent choice of uh, y one y two y three. So p y i independent, and I get this. So this I can now simplify. Okay, I'll uh, now average over this i naught out here. I get p x naught out here, and this is nothing but the dot product of m with this vector. The uh, product probability distribution of uh, px with p1. And this I know is equal to 2 to the minus. Any doubts about this? Okay. If not, uh, let's go to the next one. Yeah. Now, suppose, uh, yeah, so, so the, this is for i less than i naught. Now, uh, remember, we are trying to understand what is the uh, uh, expected uh, probability of error. So uh, another source of error occurs if the decoder does not accept uh, I naught. So let us say the decoder has reached the I naught uh, iteration. Okay. Now, what is the expected probability over the choice of Y1 to Yn that the decoder does not uh, accept symbol Yi? So that is easier to analyze. So uh, X naught is generated according to the conditional probability out here. And the probability the decoder does not accept is one minus uh, this, okay? And uh, if I take expectation over code book, uh, I have Y1 to Yn, but the only relevant one is Yi naught. So I put it out here. And then when I plug it in, I get the joint probability out here, I get this. And uh, 
And remember, I mean, these are probabilities that add up to once. So I get one here, and this is the dot product of M with the joint distribution from the connector. And this is exactly to that side. So that's it. So, uh, so we can finish the analysis. So suppose YI0 is the actual symbol that generated the sample X0. So the expected probability that the decoder does not output YI0 overall. So I can now use the union bound on probabilities. Okay. So the it's a usual analysis, I mean, you have to break, uh, break it up into the summation. So I get something like this. And the way I have chosen my uh, N out here, uh, so I zero can go up to at most n, so I get that this is less than two epsilon. So this proves the packing lemon expectation. So similarly, we can now prove the concentration version by the method of bounded differences. Okay, same as before. And again, note that the bounds in the expectation version here, not the concentration version here, involve uh, alphabet size of Same proof as earlier. Uh, so, uh, so what will be the uh, just, just one question. So, what will be the instantiation of the this arbit function? It will be an uh, it, it will be an, an indicator. It will be this right? quantity. It'll be the yeah, probability. It'll be the exact. Uh, it will. It will be the, the prob probability. It will be the probability. Okay. okay. It will be the probability. It will be this. I mean, whatever is in between this box bracket to this box bracket. Yeah. 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 Got it. It will be this probability. Okay. I mean, I mean it will be the average. Sorry, it will be exactly this from one uh, by everything, a, everything that is inside the event, basically. Yeah, everything is there. So I have picked up uh, the input is an n triple y1 to yn, and I evaluate this like one by n all the way up to there. That is the function. And now you can easily see if I change only yi to y prime i, things will only change by one by n. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so let's stop the recording. Uh, any more questions? Okay, so we'll meet on uh, Tuesday.